So Chris, fantastic to join you after your keynote session here at AWS Summit London. So much, I thought it was really powerful. And what I loved about that is not just the spoken about the technology and how that's making a difference in healthcare, but the human stories that you brought to the fore as well. I love that. So for the audience today, can you share a bit more about your role at Genomics England and kind of how that way came to be a pass, really? Sure. So I'm the Chief Executive at Genomics England. Um, I've been with the organization for just coming up for three years. And before that, I've done a real mix of things. I've been a diplomat for the UK, so I was in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Bosnia. Um, did spend some time in consulting around technology strategy. Um, and before this was working with a machine learning company called Quantum Black, and we were building a range of applications for um, different, uh, different folks. But we did a lot of work in life sciences. And so that was kind of the link through to Genomics England. What have you seen as the biggest challenge and change with obviously the COVID situation? Because it's mm. really accelerated the curve in terms of innovation you know, HPC Consortium was something I was involved in. Right. Um, could you kind of bring to light what you've been doing there and the, the innovation that's brought about? Absolutely. So it's interesting you use the word ecosystem. It's a word that we use a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, we largely see our mission as being to enable this whole ecosystem of genomics um, in the UK and beyond. And it's an incredibly rich ecosystem across all of the different parts of the NHS, um, academia, technology, sort of lab tech, the sequencing companies, um, biosciences and life, uh, life sciences and pharma, um, a huge, um, huge range of profiles, different organizations and so on. What COVID did was really actually electrify that whole ecosystem and kind of galvanize it into action. And I think the UK can be extraordinary proud of the contribution that we've made, both in terms of sequencing the virus itself and spotting all of the different variants and so on, um, sequencing humans, which was where we came in to understand how our DNA relates to the severity of the response um, to COVID, feeding those insights through into an um, incredibly rapid and well-structured set of clinical trials through the recovery trials, repurposing drugs like dex dexamethasone, baricitinib, um, and feeding those straight through into clinical practice. And so we saw that um, things that in the normal with normal approaches and in the normal run of things would have taken multiple years were happening in weeks or months um, and so one of the things that we're thinking about as we you know touch words start coming out of the pandemic um, is how can we keep some of that sense of vision purpose and pace to yeah. um, you know keep keep that pace of innovation moving absolutely. forward absolutely no i love that i think we have seen this contagion of positive change let's reclaim that word for something <laughs> yeah. positive I think, which is great and again but in terms of collaboration organizations that maybe were traditionally competitive really came together didn't we yeah um, like i think the biggest 11 tech companies in the world including aws were part of that consortium as an example yeah. so great you know power of what we can do with more open data sharing i think is fantastic um, another area that is personal interest, so bias uh, uh, acknowledged on this one, but I was a founder of a startup mm -hmm. um, a few years ago that was very much around using DNA for clinical trials. Right. So we used then like blockchain and AI, kind of like perfect marriage in many ways to kind of embed trust and help encourage more people to donate their data and have that choice about how it's going to be used. So mm -hmm. whether it's for a research project, whether you want that to be monetized or, or free for charity use, for example. Are you doing anything around that? Because again, I think that's an ongoing challenge to, to get more, particularly for underrepresented groups. Absolutely. Well, there's a there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, yeah, there's a long you've used, um, <laughs> you've used some of my favourite words though, which are um, trust and choice. I think those have to lie at the centre of everything that we do. Um, at Genomics England, through the 100,000 Genomes Project, we developed a a model of data governance, which I think is really powerful and has stood us in really good stead. Where the participants who took part in the project um, elected representatives to a participant panel. Fantastic. Um, who are incredibly generous with their time um, and who really help us to make the best decisions that we can make about how that data gets used. Brilliant. And as one example of that, people talk about um, engagement, we talk about involvement and so on. I think a word that's underused is power. Yes. Um, yes. And the participants have um, the power to veto any use of the data. So any researchers, for example, who want to get access to the data to look for new diagnostics or new therapeutics um, need to be approved by a group called the Access Review Committee. The participants sit on that panel and if they want, can uh, veto any proposals, can ask any questions they want, reassure themselves that this is a good use of, um, of their data. Fantastic. So one of the big questions for us is, as we're scaling to um, a, a clinical service with the NHS and as we're scaling the work we're doing on research, mm -hmm. 
how can we keep that sense of um, transparency, of trust, yep. of, um, of empowerment um, of those groups of, uh, of patients and research participants. Fantastic. I love that. The power of voice all coming together there equally, yeah. I think, is superb. And again, kind of a personal question here. I talk about the age of convergence a lot. So all these different technologies coming together and helping to scale change. So when you think about personalised medic medication or medicine and where we're going here, you know, what's your vision? Where would you like to be? You know, if we're having this conversation in a couple of years' time, what would you hope that's changed, either specifically in life sciences or, or more broadly for that? So it's a great... Um, it's a great moment, I think, of yeah. history that we live in. As you say, that all of these technologies are coming together. It's quite extraordinary. Um, I sometimes think about this as almost a sort of um, Spotify model of healthcare. Yeah. Bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> so I love listening to um, Discover Weekly, which is my playlist. Yep. Yep. It gets generated by machine learning on the back of data that, um, on what, in this case, what music I'm listening to. <laughs> Let's imagine we take that model of, there's an implicit data exchange here. I'm comfortable sharing my data um, about what I'm listening to. In return, I get um, recommendations that um, are really positive for me. If we can get to a point where we have a level of trust that um, people, citizens, feel comfortable sharing their data about their health, whether that's their DNA data, their clinical data, and so on, in exchange for recommendations about their lifestyle, about their diet, about exercise, about um, maybe um, if you're high risk for a particular thing, get being part of a screening program earlier in your life, yeah. Um, potentially even getting to the stage where we can say we can start um, making interventions before a disease manifests itself. So putting someone who's at really high risk of heart disease onto statins preemptively yeah. rather than waiting for them to have a heart attack. Um, I think that's an incredibly powerful vision. Um, and, and really from, uh, from cradle to grave, so to speak. Yeah. One of the projects we're working on at the moment is around um, exploring this concept of um, being able to opt into being uh, having your baby uh, sequenced at birth. Yeah. Um, huge set of you know ethical questions there around um, choice and around sure. the, over the course of that person's lifetime, what they choose to do and so on. We know that um, markers in our DNA can help us understand a, a whole range of hundreds of individually rare but collectively quite common diseases yeah. that affect children in early childhood. And actually that's one way right at the beginning of life to give someone the best possible start yeah. to make, make those early interventions where they matter the most. But also then there's a really interesting question that we're exploring mm. around what would it mean to have your genome, have access to your genome as you grow up, as you're a teenager in your 20s, Absolutely. 30s, 40s, screening for things like cancer, heart disease, mm. or later life, um, things like neurodegenerative disease. So in many ways we're thinking about this as kind of a hundred year project mm. and yes. we're really at the stage of asking questions and testing hypotheses now rather than providing answers but that's something where we've talked to lots of parents, midwives, mm. others in the community and we'll continue to try and collectively figure out what we think um, the best way is to try and capture some of that potential while managing um, you know, very uh, robust challenges around the access to data, about the use of data Absolutely. and so on. I'd be fascinating the benchmark data you would get over that like, 100 year period you were describing yeah. it there. I mean, fantastic data, so I love that. Yeah. Um, maybe one final question, slight tangent, if I may. So again, one of the themes I think is running through today is around inclusion. Mm. I've literally just come from the Get IT finals, which was amazing. So there were yeah. two um, girl teams there, just presented, you know, 11, 12 years old, eight minute presentations, absolutely amazing. It was just, the confidence was fantastic to see. Um, what would you advise people you know, from a diversity of experience who might be thinking about a career in life sciences or tech what would your advice be? And is there any opportunities at Genomics England at the moment? It'd be great to share a little bit about that too. Absolutely. So diversity is a big word for us. I mean, on, on the one hand, there's a, a historic issue around genomic data and diversity yes. of representation yep. in the data sets that we've just launched a big uh, program around to engage with different communities and make sure that we can earn their trust um, to be part of these research programs that can really benefit them and their communities. We also recognise that for that trust to exist, mm. the world of genomics itself has to reflect the communities that we serve. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And so with um, Health Data Research UK and others, we're taking part, as one example of this, in the 10,000 Black Interns Programme. Um, we have very diverse recruitment pipelines and um, our metrics on, you know, on the organisation are almost kind of astoundingly diverse in lots of different ways Super. in terms of age, um, gender, the countries people come from, yeah. their, their backgrounds and so on. Um, and, and also I think their sort of mindset. Um, yes. You know, we have, yep. we have very deep scientists who have studied genomics their whole lives. We have mm. 
UX designers, um, we have um, you know cloud architects, we have all of these different profiles, all with very different um, mindsets. Yeah. But actually, when they come together, they can do things and kind of make magic in a way that individually, no, each of those individual disciplines could never do. That's, a, that's incredible. And people watching here will know I talk about STEAM learning quite a lot. Right. So again, put that arts in it. And you've just yep. literally described that kind of neurodiversity or different forms of experience, emotional intelligence, creativity, curiosity. Great word. We've heard a lot here today yep. as well. So fantastic. You're really kind of putting that center stage as well. So thank you for sharing that, Chris, as well. It kind of takes us full circle, I think, about why this matters so much. So thank you for joining us, Chris. Thank you so much. A real pleasure. And thank you for watching. Thank you.